Morbid curiosity is a huge part of human history. Those of us that seek out scary stories, murder mysteries, and crime documentaries are some of the biggest culprits. For most of us, we view it as a guilty pleasure. A way to stay interested and invested in someone else's demise is a tale as old as time. There are many songs out there detailing our morbid curiosity, Don Henley's Dirty Laundry or Tool's Vicarious come to my mind. But what's really going on behind the scenes in our brains? Why are we wired to enjoy these stories, and why are some folks more or less sensitive than others? Let's find out in this week's episode of The Neuro Nerd. Morbid curiosity refers to a fascination with disturbing, violent, or tragic events such as death, accidents, or the macabre. It's the psychological drive to seek information about threatening or unsettling subjects, even if it evokes fear. Historically, morbid curiosity has appeared in many forms. In ancient times, Roman crowds flocked to gladiator games, while medieval Europe saw public executions draw large audiences. In fact, recently I just finished The Count of Monte Cristo where there was a huge chapter on a public execution of a thief. And out of our main characters, two of them were grossly intrigued, but one of them felt super flush and dizzy while viewing it. As such, we've known for quite some time that some of us are more sensitive than others with these taboo topics. Back then, these spectacles were justified as moral deeds, but they also fed a deep human intrigue surrounding death and suffering. During the Victorian era, we were introduced to mourning photography, where still pictures of dead loved ones were taken. Soon after, seances became popular and the Ouija board hit the market with incredible demand. In modern psychology, morbid curiosity has been studied as a natural extension of exploratory behavior, sometimes linked to trait openness or sensation seeking. When we read books like The Hunger Games or As I Lay Dying, we're in a sense evoking a neural system that has been passed down to us for generations. But what can we learn of this phenomenon through the lens of neuroscience? Oosterweck and colleagues in 2020 designed an fMRI study with 60 participants where they were asked to make choices to view either negative or positive images, with the negative image being that of a soldier kicking a civilian in the head, and the positive being a child throwing petals at a wedding. They hypothesized that choosing a negative image would result in stronger activation of reward circuitry. By the way, kudos to these researchers for pre-registering their study, that was really cool to see. In sum, they did find some evidence of this being the case, such that there was greater activation of the striatum, inferior frontal gyrus, and the anterior cingulate cortex. This study focused a lot on the ACC and anterior insular activation, which makes sense since the ACC seems to be associated with pain perception, social abilities, and emotional reactivity. But there's still a lot left to uncover. For example, I think it's a bit of a stretch to assume that just the AIC and ACC reflect reward circuitry, especially since we know that dopaminergic systems, which is a big part of motivational processing, usually involves other regions too, like the nucleus incumbens, amygdala, ventral tegmental, and just in general frontal striatal pathways. And so the authors interpret these findings as somewhat of an indication that negative images have quote, high informational value. Even if you don't particularly enjoy the images that you're seeing, we still assign high information to them. However, we also know in reward literature that information is not typically labeled as primary reward, and it's often seen as a secondary or indirect reward. But this has been challenged in recent decades in curiosity literature where we see dopaminergic pathways being highly activated even for secondary rewards. Outside of Oosterweck, we sadly don't know much else in terms of neuroscience and morbid curiosity, but we do have a lot of literature on general curiosity, which may help us render some ideas. Interestingly, just as I mentioned previously with reward processing, Kang and colleagues in 2009 designed a curiosity test in MRI where folks rated trivia questions. Caudate and inferior frontal gyrus were activated, but shockingly, the nucleus accumbens, which is a super important structure for reward processing, was not. Taken together, I think it is safe to say that we're dealing with other valence structures and not just reward or positive valence systems. For those of you who know my videos at this point, you know that I subscribe to the RDoc framework or the research domain criteria. And so instead of sp focusing on specific disorders like depression or anxiety, RDoc focuses on fundamental psychological and neurophysiological constructs like reward processing or cognitive control or social behavior. So while these positive valence systems like reward responsiveness or approach motivation are 
seemingly implicated in morbid curiosity, it also seems like negative valence systems, like acute threat or potential threat, may also play a role. The involvement of the amygdala and insula points to the salience and emotional arousal that sort of accompany this idea of anticipation or viewing morbid content, even if it's aversive. Morbid curiosity seems to sit right at the intersection of these two systems, this motivated approach towards negative or threatening stimuli. But why? Dr. Scrivener, who is an expert in morbid curiosity, seems to think that simulating dangerous situations in our minds help us to cope with morbidity. Quote, One of the key ideas underlying morbid curiosity is that we simulate threatening scenarios in order to reduce the cost of learning threat-related information while retaining many of the benefits. We can watch a horror movie, play a scary video game, or engage in thrilling play as a way of exposing ourselves to analogs of dangerous situations. Cognitively playing with threatening simulations can teach us behavioral and emotional strategies for dealing with dangerous situations. He also believes that nightmares are a form of involuntary morbid curiosity where we have no choice but to face our fears in harrowing situations. Been there. <laughs> Not fun. <laughs> but what are the mechanisms behind the enjoyment of watching or consuming potentially dangerous or threatening situations? In another paper by Miller, White, and Scrivener, they explore why people are drawn to horror media by applying the predictive processing framework. This is a cognitive neuroscience model where the brain constantly predicts sensory inputs and updates its internal model by minimizing prediction errors. For those of you that watched my other video on the uncanny valley effect, you've already heard me talk at length about prediction errors. The brain is motivated not just to reduce uncertainty, but to optimize the rate at which prediction errors are reduced. So horror content creates this somewhat dynamic environment of uncertainty, like, I don't know, for example, suspense or jump scares, which drives learning and emotional engagement. Horror engages the brain in a sort of Goldilocks zone where it's not too predictable and not too chaotic. It's providing this rewarding experience when prediction errors are resolved faster or more effectively than expected. So this becomes emotionally satisfying to us and very, in my case, I would argue evolutionarily adaptive. So it doesn't seem like the authors have explored EEG yet, which is a brain imaging method that records electrical activity. Um, one EEG signal that I think could be especially useful here is called the error-related negativity or the ERN for short. And it's just a small spike in brain activity that happens when you make a mistake, like for example, pressing the wrong button in a game. And it tends to be even bigger when that mistake is surprising or emotionally charged. So. I think this makes a perfect candidate for testing predictive processing theories since the whole entire framework is about how the brain reacts when its predictions don't match reality. So I think it would be really cool if the authors used this component to test their theory. You could essentially design a study where participants watch horror clips or play horror games under different uncertainty conditions and then perform some error prone task like Stroop for example to elicit these ERNs. And then you could ask, okay. Is the ERN amplified? Is it blunted? Has it been unchanged? Does it depend on anxiety traits or horror fan status? You could ask questions like, after watching horror versus neutral content, does the brain respond differently to making mistakes? But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we're quite there yet with the research, but this is why video essays like this are so important to expanding our understanding, especially to the general public, because I think a lot of these really great papers just get thrown and sifted under so many others and it, it takes a lot for us to be able to translate what we find in a general platform. Morbid curiosity does seem to have some real life advantages though. In yet another paper with Scrivener and colleagues from 2021, they found that horror fans and morbidly curious individuals were more psychologically resilient during the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, this Goldilocks zone of curiosity seems to be very adaptive and it allows for learning and preparing the brain for potentially devastating events. In the end, morbid curiosity isn't just a guilty pleasure. It's a deeply rooted cognitive phenomenon that bridges our need to learn with our instinct to survive. 
through the lens of neuroscience and this idea of predictive processing, I think we begin to see how our brains use these experiences to fine tune emotional responses and reduce uncertainty and to also help us prepare for that unpredictable and oftentimes very scary reality that we face. And while there's still a whole lot to explore, especially in domains like EEG, which is where I primarily work, um, what we do know is that morbid curiosity plays a very meaningful role in emotional regulation or resilience through these adaptive behaviors. So I suppose the next time you hit play on a scary movie or a true crime doc, just remember your brain might be doing a little homework on survival. Thanks guys for listening and I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you.